So the, the article that I sent you on optimizing learning strategies, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. I read it and, and what it was she was saying was that you can't necessarily depend on extinction. You may just have to do relearning, but then the relearning yes. doesn't always hold up. Yeah, so she was, she was talking about um, the combination of two important strategies for having people um, overcome a threat response, which can be uh, shown to be based on false premises. That is, there's an overprediction that this is likely to happen if I engage in this situation, yeah. and an underprediction of their ability to cope. So it's, it's a probability thing going on. And what she's saying is that the the, two, the standard means to doing that have been one: ask people to stay in their scary situation long enough for them to get used to it, which we call habituation. Yeah. And the secondary one is what's called inhibitory learning which is learning new ways to manage yourself in a given situation, which basically inhibits the old way, overlays the old circuitry and allows for new circuitry to emerge. Um, and that needs to be practiced frequently for that new memory to be consolidated. And, and Tom, it's also why CBT for many people doesn't seem to do the trick. And it's because the, they do really well on the C part, challenging thoughts and automatic um, the automatic thoughts and they change the self-talk but when push comes to shove and they're in a situation where they think they might die that those cognitions fly out the window unless you know that the procedure for fire warning on an airplane you know when the bell goes off the first thing you do is you silence the bell so that you well can... that's the recall of the alarm yeah yeah you want to get rid of the alarm so that you can yeah. think think clearly because you can't work through the other things if this alarm's going bang, bang, bang. It's done its job. It's got your yeah. attention. Now the time is to swing back into action and go through the checklists. Right now, the question is, how does the alarm get recalled? And my guess is that, that with a child who's securely attached, you have what Bowlby would call an internal working model of secure attachment so that when you get a feeling of alarm, you just quickly calm down because you figure it's not going to be the end of the world. But if you don't have that security, when you feel the alarm, you stay alarmed. There was a gal who's a neurologist who did a thing on YouTube. She said, well, you know, when you get a shot of stress hormones, you don't think clearly for 90 seconds. Just don't, just wait 90 seconds before you make any decisions. Well, that's okay if there's not an emergency. But what we need to do with airplanes, and I think what we need to do with panic and what we need to do with fear of flying is, as soon as you get that shot of alarm, we need to have the parasympathetic nervous system kick in and close it down so you can think clearly. I'd like that woman to tell Sully Sullenberg, Sully, say calm for 90 seconds. That ain't gonna help. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so I think in theory, the idea is what can we do to help people have a, a more, um, toned vagal system, shall we say, mm -hmm. so that the parasympathetic system, that part of the autonomic nervous system that has the opportunity to put the brakes on compared to yes. the acceleration yeah. of the sympathetic system, and how can we sort of tune it up a bit more yeah. so that it has the capacity to automatically silence or bring down several steps. There's a lot to be said for improving parasympathetic systems. And of course, the raw road to do that is through diaphragmatic breathing plus emotional connection to the breathing. That's the raw easiest road for the average person to use. Well, Without, breathing out helps, but as soon as you breathe in, you lose your it's, it's, vagal tone. It's more the regulation, it's the pattern, I think, Tom. If you look at the breathing patterns in either fleeing or freezing, it's either <laughs> running away <laughs> or it's... <gasps> So you've got disturbed breathing patterns. So while the breathing out part tends to lower heart rate and the breathing in tends to raise it, it's the pattern of up and down okay, breathing. So, so that's that why is you, the part that we're after with, with, our, with our training. So that's why you're using the, um, the apps. You got it. Let me show you. Okay. okay what, Let me show you. I was going to ask you about that. But what I wanted to 
to tell you that what I've been working on is, is Porges' notion that the face, voice, and touch activate the calming system. And I think maybe I mentioned last, last time, I stumbled on to finding that when people link being on the airplane to getting engaged because they're totally accepted, when they're getting saying wedding vows, they're, they have a person who's 100% sending them signals of safety that if we link that to being on the airplane, they look, they do, they do great. They don't panic. So what I've been looking for is say you just need to find a person, doesn't have to be wedding or engagement or whatever. You just need to find a person who who's really not judgmental. Yes. And then link that person to walking on the plane, sitting down in the seat. Yes. The, seat the challenge down. we have, Tom is that some people have lived, have lived rather impoverished lives and yeah. they don't have anyone. Well, okay, so let's go back to that. Let's say you've got a person who's completely devoid of good relationships. Maybe they can build a good relationship with a the therapist. I think we're, we're, in, we're into really interesting territory here, Tom, because years yeah. ago, people didn't talk about this in, in this sort of format. It was very cloistered in psychoanalytic circles, in, 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 <laughs> in, in very high-end expensive conferences, and everyone talked the same language, and now it's all out there. So we're talking here about multiple redundancies. I think the ultimate redundancy, Tom, the ultimate one is something that we might call self-soothing or self-compassion, where you don't need anyone else anything else, any object, but you can engage in your own self-soothing and you can rely upon yourself to do that. I think that's kind of one of the ultimate aims. That's what I would call the Iron Chef approach. Well, Whatever yes. happens, I can handle this. Yeah, except, but my question is, I am guessing that all of our calming, because of the way we're genetically wired up, starts with some other person. I don't know that we can self-soothe without a reference at some point to another person who activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, that's a fabulous question, though. Is there something a person can do to self-soothe that really doesn't depend on escape or does it depend on another person? Have a look behind me, Tom. Yeah. And everyone else. Uh, and I'm, I'm asking you to look at, at this section here. Yeah? Yeah. This section. This is heart rate. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, the scale is beats per minute. Okay. Uh -huh. And on this one, it's going from 50 up to 80. So this person's averaging between 60 and 70 is what, what this is doing. Now, this is her normal breathing pattern without any, any activity going on. But then when I start to teach her some diaphragmatic breathing, that is now become consciously aware from where you're breathing and the rhythm of your breathing. Things change. And I want you to see, Tom, and everybody else. Now, have a look at the pattern here. I think you can see here there's hardly any pattern. There's a bit of ups and downs, but there's not much of a pattern there. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But when she begins to do the diaphragmatic breathing, see if you can pick, see if you can pick when she engages in diaphragmatic breathing. So you've got some steady patterns there. Okay. What yeah. can you see? What can you see there? It's not, it's not chaotic anymore. It's very regular. Yeah. yeah. Can you see this? Look at that. Mm -hmm. This is the first 20 minutes of a session as I'm explaining. She's all hooked up. So we have a, a device. And that looks a bit like this. And it just goes on the ear, like so, yeah? And then it goes into a, a, little, a little box and then goes into my Mac or your PC. Uh, there are portable versions by Bluetooth that will go into your Android or your iPhone. So we're just chatting for 20 minutes about breathing in general and blah, blah, blah. But to get it to go into this pattern takes roughly three cycles of quality five in, pause, five out, about three cycles, and she starts to produce this pattern. They've got nice breathing, and they'll actually say subjectively, I'm feeling actually quite nice and feeling a bit calm. That's quite good. And then I'll go, clap, 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 clap. And this thing will spike all over the place as their sympathetic <laughs> systems 
Yeah, yeah. Because they can't shut that down. Sometimes, if I'm not getting that much out of the clap, I'll get a, uh, a football. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And that'll okay. cut right through as well. Yeah, these are little add ons. Mm -hmm. And then what you're going to see is within a few moments, the thing goes all over the place again. Okay. And then you say to people, okay, put that away, nothing else. You go back to your breathing. Let's see how many cycles it takes for that pattern to kick in again. About uh -huh. three, about three quality cycles. It represents a minute. And what it means is that when you say to someone, come on, Tom, just hang in there, do your breathing. We'll get, we'll get these panicky symptoms under control within about a minute or so. They've got evidence that it works because they've seen it happen. There's physical evidence that it happens. Well, okay, so, let, me t let, let me show you what I'm, what I'm concerned about. That if you are in a situation where there's not an external stimulus that's going to trigger you and that you're not having thoughts that are triggering you, um, that when you breathe out, you this heart rate slows, when you breathe back in, it speeds up and you get that steady cycle. Mm -hmm. And your heart rate is overall lower, maybe by some average, what it may be, what, 12 to 20, something like that overall. But if you're in turbulence, you've got the external stress that is like your horn there, that the amygdala is going to react to the feeling of dropping. So when you breathe, out, you are getting protection. You're getting this, the vagus nerve is stimulated. But when you breathe back in, you don't get any carryover because immediately the turbulence comes in. Yeah, what the article was trying to do, Tom, was to set up a, a series of patterns where over time and with increasing practice, we can basically tell that amygdala through our actions, paired actions, frequently practiced, stand down at ease, go into the background, keep monitoring for true alarms that I might need you to act on. But right now, what we're doing is a learnt activity which requires frontal lobe. You need to go into the background, frontal lobe, you need to come forward and help me do what I need to do. The more you've practiced and repeated that activity, so you can now be very sure that it will kick in, because you've practiced enough and you've now got the visible, the visual feedback here that you can do it, um, the more likely you're going to see that amygdala back out of the process of managing stress and threat. And it's going to be a much more frontal lobe thing. The problem is, Les, if you look at Ledoux's research, he says, you know, if you shock the rat and then you play the tone, you shock the rat, do that four or five times, you condition the rat to expect the shock when you play the tone. And he says, if you then play the tone and you don't shock the rat after four or five repetitions, one set of memory cells in the amygdala has learned not to react. But he says there's another set, which he calls the storage cells. And he says, exposure with that set, it doesn't want to relearn. He says, if you continue playing the tone with no shock for an extended period of time, you may get a 50% reduction. But all it takes to blow it out of the water is just one more bad situation and you you lose all your conditioning so it's that it's that situation where a person has been in turbulence long enough that the storage cells are indelibly imprinted with i'm going to release stress hormones when the plane drops yeah so what i'm figuring is maybe the answer is just produce oxytocin it, when you're on the plane, <laughs> so keep the well, that, that, would, the that would be one way of doing, but I don't think we can sort of rely on, on that all the time. I, I think we've got to keep in mind two things. Um, number one, when the amygdala was discovered for its function, I mean, people just didn't understand what its purpose was. Yeah. For that, we had to wait for the 1920s where surgery evolved so that you could actually go into the amygdala, destroy it, and keep the animal alive yeah. and see what the net, net effects were. Yeah. So in the 1920s, the main target animal were rhesus monkeys. Yep. And what was really interesting is that when you destroyed bilaterally rhesus monkeys' amygdala, they couldn't learn new fears. Uh -huh. Their capacity to learn new fears was interrupted. However, they did not forget old fears. Jeez. They were still there. 
someplace else than stored. Okay. It was stored elsewhere in the emotional processing part of the brain, but in the limbic system, it was stored hippocampus and elsewhere. Hippocampus, yeah. Okay. They couldn't learn new memories. And the other thing that was understood from about the 70s or 80s, the other purpose of the amygdala is as it's the test bed for curiosity. In other words, things which are novel, where you know, I don't know what that is. I'm checking out my memory bank. Something's coming towards me and I don't know what it is. There's nothing about this thing that's telling me what it is. There's nothing that resembles something that I know how to react to. So you have a choice. You can either go and run and hide yeah. until the thing becomes obvious to you. Then you can say, oh, that might be my lunch rather than I'm its lunch. Uh -huh. Or you can run towards it with excitement that I'm finally going to get fed or have sex or whatever it might be. And then maybe too late, you discover your lunch. <laughs> yes. So okay. throughout human history, those parts of the of a human population that have survived have been those who've got a well-developed run and hide routine rather than, oh, let's see what that is, because they're going to perish in time. Well, Porteous's notion is that that when you see a person, you unconsciously pick up signals from their face and voice quality and body language or touch. And if you are in a social situation and meet a new person, you probably are going to get signals they're not going to attack you physically, but they might verbally. So you get some calming and you, you don't, it, it may be, covers over the feeling that you've got to run, but you're not really comfortable until you're with a person that you're getting the signals that they are on the same page with you, that they're not going to hurt you emotionally. And then you get full stimulation of the vagus that overrides the, the stress. But I also want to tell you this thing about the oxytocin. Sue mm. Carter I had a chance to hang out with her once when uh, her husband, Steve, was giving a presentation. And she said that if you get a shot of oxytocin naturally, you're probably going to have your fear system shut down for about half an hour. But if you think about the things that the memories of holding a newborn child or nursing a child or sexual foreplay or afterglow or interacting with your pet or getting a hug, if you think about them, you're going to get a little oxytocin. And if you link that to walking on the plane and sitting down on the seat, take off, cruise and so on, you're going to get some oxytocin every four or five minutes. That's what I've been working at. But I wanted to tell you that I had this client who I was doing a counseling session with him when he was in the course, but six months earlier, he'd read the book. And the book talks about <clears throat> oxytocin being used in that way. And he hadn't had a chance to practice the exercise. So he hadn't set it up to be automatically being discharged every few minutes. So he said he was on a flight <clears throat> up at cruise altitude, got into some turbulence. And he said he, it really got rough and he got truly frightened. And he remembered the thing about sexual things producing oxytocin. And he said something very charming. This guy, by the way, was in Mumbai, uh, uh, India. We were having this conversation. And he said, Tom, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm happily married. My wife and I get along fine. But for some reason, I started thinking about my ex-girlfriend. And he started saying that this memory then, he kept doing it for the entire time he was in the turbulence and it took care yeah. of the fear. It was completely gone. So apparently, even if you have the amygdala pretty well established in its storage cells to react to the feeling of dropping, now, I don't know about the hippocampus, maybe that's involved too. But if you produce oxytocin, it seems to take, it seems to turn the amygdala off so that if, even if it's programmed to react, it's not going to. Uh, sitting behind me up here is a picture of a, of a Navy SEAL. And one of the things that I show during the course of my work with patients is how Navy SEALs train. That some of these people have got that background, that, that connectivity. And so what the Navy SEALs have been doing over the last 20 years is changing their training programs to take into account the neuroscience of which we've been speaking. They go to work knowing they could die. Whereas what we're trying to do is say to patients, you won't die doing this, you just feel like you will. They have been told, 
you've got to be able to carry out the mission despite all these yucky sensations. If you, if you actually look at the worst it can be, and you're going to do it anyway, your amygdala, whatever part, it, whatever part of your executive function is trying to save your butt, gives up. This is what I found flying fighters and racing cars. One of the things that happened that, that's along that line is as if it wasn't enough to be flying F-100s, which one out of three crashed. I bought a race car yeah. when it was in Germany. Yeah. And when I would slide into the car, it was form fitting. It was a Lola Formula Junior. Like yeah, yeah. it was the same chassis as the Formula One. So you slide into the car and it's form fitting. You really slither into it. And when you're in, you're really in. Yeah. And, and I would slide into there. And when I was in the car, I would have this thought. I swear to God, it, it was just this clear. You shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thought, it wasn't quite worse, but it was a sense which was, well, if I tell you when you're going around a curve at 90 miles an hour that you shouldn't be doing this, we're both gonna get killed. So I'm getting out of the car. Yeah. And, and literally that commitment that I'm, that I, yes, I might get killed doing this, but I'm doing it anyway. I went into a state of peace. Yeah, I recall some time back watching a documentary on the British Lancaster bombers of World War II. They're the ones who lifted off at the various air bases and went off to Germany and dropped bombs in Dresden, wherever else. And of course, copped a huge amount of anti-aircraft activity, plus the, the various uh, Stuckers or whatever else they were shooting them down. And, and generally speaking, you, 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 you could take a break after you successfully completed 10 missions. Well, the vast majority of people didn't complete 10 missions. Uh -huh. you know, so there was a huge attrition rate. And I remember one of the guys saying, who was a gunner sitting at, at, in the tail, he said, how did we get through this and carry out our mission knowing what was happening? And they said, we just accepted that we're going to die doing this. And that just let us get on with the job. Because you, you didn't have to worry about that anymore. And you could, you could do your job. You just accepted that's what my fate is. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's a very kind of negative way to talk about fear of flying when there is no danger. But... Over the course of, of human existence, we've all worked out, human beings have worked out a way to manage how do I confront my fear reactions in, in such situations. And over the course of time, various cultures and, and ways of doing things have worked out how do I keep on doing a high performance job, even in the face of really difficult challenges to my survival. Now, lots of our patients, this is where I think psychologists sometimes get it wrong, Tom, is that we don't realize the strength of fear that our patients yeah. possess. And because sometimes they don't want to tell us. In a state of panic, they may they freeze and believe yeah. that they are really about to die. And yeah. then in a way they do because they lose their sense of self. They lose a sense yeah. of time. They lose a sense yeah. of place. And they go into a state which if they could be comfortable with it might be considered enlightenment in some cultures, but it's terror. It's just, dissociated terror and if you go into it intentionally in a sport where you have your sense of self place and time disappear you can use that additional mental capability to do the sport better Sisman Zali wrote a book called flow about this but in in automobile racing we have what's called racing nine tenths, 10 tenths and 11 tenths. On a long race, you can't keep your concentration up all the time. So no. you go around a hundred mile an hour curve at 90 miles an hour, that's driving nine tenths. If it's a short race, you can keep your concentration up. So you go around the hundred mile an hour curve at hundred. But there's a situation where you go around the curve at this hundred mile an hour curve at 110. How's that possible? It is a hundred mile an hour curve in your ordinary state of mind. But when you go into the state of flow, where you push aside your sense of place and time and, 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 and your sense of self, you take that part of your brain that's normally mentally reserved to do orientation times three, and now it's available to drive the car. So in yeah. this extraordinary state of mind, the 110 mile an hour curve is, you can go around at 110, but you can't go around it at any other state of mind. Yeah. So one of the things that occurs at the end of the, the video that I show patients, which features the seals, 
the the guy that you saw here says mm -hmm. something happens when you learn what to do to master your fear reaction. That doesn't mean you never experience fear. That is, you, you, you don't change the probabilities. You're very aware of the probabilities. You mm -hmm. do the job anyway. So what he says at the end is, when you can do that, when you master that, you see and do things you never thought you could imagine to do. A whole world opens up to you. you your limitations drop away. It's the inverse of what happens with anxiety. With anxiety, as you know, things tend to ooze out into other domains. You start to live a life. It, it's no longer restricted to turbulence on a plane. It becomes elevators. It becomes driving on freeways. It becomes going to parties. Your general sense of efficacy, of overcoming the normal little jitters of going to a new place and whatever else, with anxiety, they get over amplified. Everything becomes a catastrophe. This is great stuff, and it's character building. And at one point, working on the SOAR course, you know, we were doing this stuff from the beginning, the stuff you're yep. talking about. And yep. then when I realized, instead of having people confront their fears like that and, and be the hero of their own life, what yep. we could do is simply make it easier. And so now, what are we going to do? build character and make it easier. So I started saying, okay, for people who can't go the way you were just talking, we can simply make it easier for them. We can give them the emotional regulation that they had the birthright to have, but didn't get. We can set it up so that they automatically produce oxytocin every three, four, five yeah. minutes when they're on the plane to shut down the amygdala. We can link to a person's face, voice and touch link that to everything that's going to happen that they can think of on the plane so that as the flight unfolds they keep getting they keep getting a sense of safety via another person who accepted them completely there's a group of people for whom this feeling of being in a safe crucible is what gets them over the line where you can hold that in mind not everyone's good at doing that by the way when you're with them and you accept them your yep. face, your voice quality, and your body language gets linked to being on the plane. And when they're oh. on the plane, they take you with, with them, without, so Tom, without, whether they know it or not. You're absolutely right. I had a patient yesterday, and, I, and she said, what should I do on future flights when I feel a bit doubtful? And I said to her, just imagine I'm sitting next to you. Mm -hmm. And what question would you ask me of what about what's happening right now and see if you can imagine what my answer would be yeah it's a two-part process yep. go outside yourself for a moment repeat what we've just done successfully uh -huh. reinvigorate that circuitry ask the question see if you can imagine what the answer would be from me well yeah and the and and that's you're you're taking care of the the, the sequence the sequence thinking but you your presence are you're also embedded in them and they take you with with them on the oh, yes. 